Did you know the BSA has had a connection to special needs and disabled scouts going all the way back to the beginning of the organization? In fact, our first chief scout executive, James E. West, contracted polio as a child, which left him with a physical disability for the rest of his life. But it never slowed down Dr. West, who led the BSA for 32 years from 1911 to 1943 when he retired. We'll learn more about the history of special needs and disabled scouts, as well as check out some of the artifacts related to this special needs scouting in a brand new display here at the National Scouting Museum in this edition of Artifact of the Week. Since its founding in 1910, the Boy Scouts of America has had fully participating scouts with physical, mental, and emotional disabilities. Although most of the BSA's efforts have been directed at keeping such scouts in mainstream packs, troops, crews, and ships, it has also recognized the special needs of those with severe disabilities. One of the earliest official references to scouting with disabilities can be found in the first edition of the BSA's Handbook for Scoutmasters, published in 1913. While the text provides descriptions for more than 19 classes of boy types, we will focus on just the four grouped as psychological types. See if you can identify any scouts you work with amongst these types of scouts. The choleric fellow who is always off at half cock, running his head into danger whenever he can, and who is extremely hectic in his makeup, is always a problem. He needs a strong hand. The scoutmaster should deal with each class of boys largely by suggestion, but in the case of the choleric fellow, he will often need to use orders and demonstrate that he himself is in the saddle. The sanguine fellow is a normal boy who, having a good digestion, a good home, and no cause for worry, sees things as they are and is apt to take them as they come. He will be the easiest kind of boy to get along with and the only thing the scoutmaster will have to do may be to provide for stimulation of his interest and ambition. The phlegmatic chap requires patience more than anything else. Generally slow of body, he is usually slow of speech and thought. Temperamentally, nature has made him what he is, and the scoutmaster will have to work harder, make things more concrete that he wants to teach, and hold his impatience in check. Phlegmatic though he is, he will prove solid in everything he does, and he will either be a rock of strength or of weakness to the scoutmaster. The hybrid boy always furnishes a guessing contest. Impulsive today, he has to be repressed. Phlegmatic tomorrow, he has to be stimulated and he may be sanguine the next day. There was never a pleasanter boy to work with, but just like the chameleon, you are never sure of his color. Somewhere in the boy's nature, if the scoutmaster is patient, he will find the rock bottom upon which he can build manhood and citizenship. The first official BSA pamphlet, working with crippled, blind, and deaf scouts, was called Their Trail to Happiness and was printed in 1943. The booklet tells the story of James E. West, as well as a man named Harry Dola, who was confined to a wheelchair and became an advocate for handicapped scouts, raising money to fund specialized programs to benefit these scouts. The booklet also lists troops from all over the country that serve disabled scouts. Included in the booklet is a photo of Troop 10 from the Kentucky School of the Blind. In the 1949 printing of the World Brotherhood edition of Aids to Scoutmastership, which was originally written by Baden-Pole in 1920, it says, through scouting there are numbers of crippled, deaf, and dumb and blind boys now gaining greater health, happiness, and hope than they ever had before. Most of these boys are unable to pass all the ordinary scout tests and are supplied with special or alternative tests. Many of these boys are by no means easy to deal with and demand far more patience and individual attention than ordinary boys. The wonderful thing about such boys is that their cheeriness and their eagerness to do as much in scouting as they possibly can. They do not want more special tests and treatment than is absolutely necessary. Scouting helps them by associating them in a worldwide brotherhood, by giving them something to do and to look forward to, by giving them an opportunity to prove to themselves and to others they can do things, and difficult things, for themselves. The idea formulated in this passage is reinforced in this February 1958 article that appeared in the National Association for Retarded Children's newsletter. Scout meetings give boys two hours of happiness. The article is on display here at the museum. 
Another inspirational article you can view is from the July 1953 Boy's Life and tells the story of a Los Angeles troop which is made up of 26 scouts, each in an iron lung. Scouts and volunteers from other troops help them learn scout skills and in the story, you learn about one scout tying a bowline inside of his iron lung while another scout observes and corrects him by watching through the portals of the unit. From 1923 to 1950, achievement awards could be earned by a scout with a permanent disability that would prevent them from meeting all of the requirements for tenderfoot second class or first class. The scout was first required to complete all of the requirements they were able to do, and once this was completed, they could request substitutions for any requirements they could not physically do through the BSA National Court of Honor. On display, we have the Achievement Award 1 and Achievement Award 2, which were available from 1923 to 1950. We also have the Tenderfoot Achievement Award, which could be earned from 1937 to 1950. From 1972 to 1989, the My Scout Badge program offered a series of segments to be earned and worn around the Scout through First Class Rank Patch. For Cub Scouts, Explorers, Sea Scouts, Adventurers, the Scouts were expected to complete all of the requirements they were able to do and then to work on modified requirements with appropriate approval until the advancement was earned. In 1965, BSA advancement policies were changed to allow for scouts of all ages to be granted extended periods of time to complete their advancement requirements. For example, Cub Scouts with special needs would be allowed to participate in Cub Scouting past their 11th birthday, and Scouts registered as Boy Scouts and now Scouts BSA would be allowed to remain registered and work on advancement past their 18th birthday. This was also the same time frame when adults were no longer allowed to earn the Eagle Scout rank. On display in the museum, we have the story of two Scouts, both of whom earned their Eagle Scout rank after the age of 18. The first is the story of Gregory John Wittine. Greg had cerebral palsy and he could not walk or talk. In his wheelchair, he carried a keyboard that allowed him to type out communications to those around him. Greg belonged to a troop composed of all scouts with cerebral palsy on Long Island, New York. By 1978, Greg had completed the 24 merit badges required to be an Eagle Scout, but by the time he was done, he was also 23 years old and BSA rules said he was too old to earn his Eagle Scout rank despite the changes made in 1965. Undaunted Greg, his family, and many in the scouting community started a campaign to change the BSA's rules, and on March 5, 1978, the BSA issued a press release announcing a change to the advancement rules and allowing Greg and moving forward all severely handicapped scouts a path to earn their Eagle Scout rank. Greg's date of rank is September 17, 1977. Greg passed away on March 5th, uh, 2023, and as requested, he was buried in a scout uniform with his merit badge sash, and his nephew has his Eagle Medal. The second scout is Theodore Teddy Marquat. Teddy was born in 1906 and became a scout as a youth near Dayton, Ohio. Despite his physical, mental, and emotional limitations, Teddy earned many merit badges and rank advancements. However, he was unable to complete the requirements to become an Eagle Scout as a youth. Fast forward to the 1970s when Eagle Scout John Lett became the Scoutmaster of Troop 1771 in Dayton, Ohio. John and Teddy became friends and John invited Teddy to join Troop 1771. He went on to help Teddy get appointed to their district committee and complete adult training courses in the area. John also helped Teddy complete more merit badges, including those he needed to earn his Eagle Scout rank. On August 6, 1990, John presented Teddy with his Eagle Scout medal at the age of 85. Over the next three years, Teddy continued to earn merit badges with his 30th and final being truck transportation in 1993. On display, you can see Teddy's merit badge sash, his Eagle medal and 45-year veteran card, and his most prized scouting possession, his hand axe. The two photographs of Teddy show him in his 1930 scout uniform and campaign hat, saluting with his left hand because he could not do so with his right, and in his wheelchair raising awareness for the American Heart Association. Teddy died on March 16, 1994, as one of the oldest active scouts in the BSA. Of course, Greg and Teddy are not the only two special needs Eagle Scouts, but are certainly worthy of representing this very special group. 
Special programming intended to bring awareness to special needs scouting began as the Handicap Awareness Trail at the 1977 Scout Jamboree. The basis for the program was developed by Dr. Jack C. Dinger, a professor of special education at Slippery Rock State College in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. From the initial six stations in the event, the Disability Awareness Challenge, as it is now called, was redesigned in 1989 and now sports more than 16 stations. Since its inception, at least 50,000 scouts have participated in the Disability Awareness Challenge at the National Jamboree. In 1980, the Handicap Awareness Merit Badge was introduced. And in 1993, the name of the Merit Badge was changed to Disability Awareness to be more accurately descriptive and inclusive. The requirements for the Merit Badge underwent a major revision in 2005 to include concepts such as visible and invisible disabilities and require scouts who earn the Merit Badge to become an advocate for people with disabilities. Other items on display include a braille version of the seventh edition of the Boy Scout Handbook, which was created by the American Printing House for the Blind of Louisville, Kentucky. The sixth edition in 1959 was the first edition created in braille and large print versions. Boys Life magazine was also published in braille, and on display we have the April 1963 issue of both the regular and braille versions. Yogi Berra on the cover was a major supporter of special needs scouting in the New York City area, hosting a celebrity golf tournament each year that raised millions of dollars for special needs scouting. Berra was also awarded the Silver Buffalo in 2003. During a visit to the museum, you can touch a copy of the January 2015 issue. In addition to braille versions of the Scout Handbook, you can see records the size of old 45 RPM records. However, these are special recordings, actually recorded at 16 and 2 thirds RPM, allowing much more material to appear on each recorded side. These examples were provided by the Recording for the Blind Library of New York City. Here at Philmont, over the last couple of years, special needs scouts have been able to participate in a week-long program at the Philmont Training Center called the Zia Experience. This program has brought many special needs scouts to Philmont and allowed them to experience a wide variety of activities found on the ranch. In addition to the Zia Experience, the summer of 2024 will see the inaugural Zia Trek, where several special needs scouts and their personal assistants will go on a multi-day trek in the backcountry to experience everything a traditional Philmont Trek has to offer. There are three awards that can be earned by scouters for their involvement and contribution to special needs scouting. The first is the Special Needs Scouting Service Award. This council level award is presented to recognize adult volunteers and professionals who serve the community of special needs scouts. The second award is the Torch of Gold Award, which is a council level distinguished award recognizing adults for a minimum of three years of exceptional service in leadership related to serving special needs scouts. The final award is the Wood Service Award. This award was established in 1978 by the Wood Services and Residential Treatment Center in Longhorn, Pennsylvania. The Wood Service Award is given in memory of Luther Wellington Lord, who served as a residential supervisor for more than 23 years at the center. Nominees for this award must be registered with the BSA and have rendered at least three years of service in a leadership role related to working with special needs scouts. The award is approved by the National Special Needs and Disabilities Awareness Committee. Now before we go, I want to tell you about two final parts of this new special needs scouting display here at the museum. The first is the story of Trenton Doherty and Chris. The story starts in the early 2000s with 12-year-old Trenton volunteering at an assisted living center for people with disabilities. Here is where Trenton met Chris and learned that he was a Boy Scout, but that his troop had disbanded before Chris could take the final step from Life Scout to Eagle Scout. Trenton suggested to his dad that Chris could register as a Lone Scout and that Trenton could serve as his Lone Scout counselor. Together, they would work on merit badges and other requirements until both were qualified to be Eagle Scouts. Now, for the next couple of years, they met to encourage one another and complete these requirements. For Chris, one obstacle was the 20-mile hike for the hiking merit badge. Now, Trenton went out and found a paved trail where he and the wheelchair-bound Chris could complete the 20-mile hike together. In March of 2021, Trenton received his Eagle Scout award, and in December of 2021, Chris received his Eagle Scout rank as well. 
For his service project, Chris led a team, including Trenton and some of the residents from his assisted living center, planting mangroves along the Florida Gulf Coast to improve the local ecosystem. As Trenton noted, Chris completed every requirement as written. The final story is about Troop 89 in Cumberland, Maryland. Their story begins in 1969 when a young man named Doug Schwab completed his Eagle Scout service project by helping four special needs people complete a camp experience. Fast forward to 1976, Doug has now graduated from college and returns home to start a troop specifically to serve special needs scouts. The troop has remained continuously chartered for nearly 50 years and is likely the longest serving special needs unit in the BSA. Over the years, the troop has served about 50 different individuals with nearly every special need you can imagine. Currently, the troop has somewhere around 12 members ranging in age from the early 20s to almost 70. Four of their members earned the rank of Eagle Scout while in the troop, with two of them still active and two that are now deceased. The troop attends summer camp each year as well as their local district and council camperees annually. They meet on Tuesday nights, and these weekly meetings are a highlight for the members of the troop. Doug served as their scoutmaster for more than 30 years and currently is an assistant scoutmaster for the troop. Last Tuesday, I had the honor of giving these guys a virtual tour of the National Scouting Museum via Zoom. We scheduled it for 30 minutes or so, and it went on for just about an hour. They had the opportunity to see everything in the special needs display as well as learn about historic uniforms, unique merit badge facts, the first Eagle Scout medal, the origin of the campaign hat and neckerchief, and see one of the first 1924 Eagle Scout rank patches that traveled to the International Space Station in 2022. Doug told me after the meeting that the Scouts were talking about the experience well after I ended the Zoom call, and I can assure you that this is not an experience I will soon forget. Thank you to Troop 89 for letting me be a part of your scouting story. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Join us next time as we continue to learn more about the history of the BSA through the collection of the National Scouting Museum and Artifact of the Week.